thank God for heaven. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18. As you're turning, I want you to make sure you take note of the little Sunday school flyer in your bulletin. We're going to be hitting Sunday school hard and heavy this fall and uh, getting our, our folks back in Sunday school, getting folks committed to Sunday school. So you make sure that you uh, go ahead and make a commitment now that you're going to be involved in Sunday school. And then uh, next Sunday evening, we'll take some time to nominate deacons. Uh, two will be rotating off, and we'll have to fill those for the next three years. So you be praying all week this week about who to nominate, and then uh, we will, uh, those that we nominate, we will vote for two on the next Sunday night, the 11th. Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18. Let the little children come. You know, the Bible speaks very clearly of the importance and of the urgency of, of salvation. The Bible's full of examples. The Bible is full of illustrations of children and of young people who were righteous and God-fearing. We read about the boy king, Josiah, in the Old Testament, a God-fearing king. David, uh, he was just a young boy, uh, Josiah was. David is a young boy, a God-fearing young man that God used in a great way. Timothy, uh, Paul's mentee, Paul mentored him. And uh, what a, a God-fearing young man he was. And so uh, the Bible is very, very clear of the importance and the urgency of salvation. Let the little children come. Would you stand as we honor the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, infallible word, beginning in verse number 1. And at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore... <clears throat> shall humble the, himself as this little child. <clears throat> the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now that does not sound like a uh, meek and mild little Jesus child, does it? Amen? I mean, he is very plain, very straightforward. All right, thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading and preaching of his word. <clears throat> While we are in here this evening, let's just say uh, it's uh, 6.30. Let's just say over the next 25 to 30 minutes, uh, statistics tell us that 29 young people are going to attempt suicide. 57 are going to run away. 14 girls are going to give birth to uh, a man who will not be in the home. They will be raised as fatherless children. 22 girls will have an abortion in the next 30 minutes. 685 teenagers will experiment with some kind of narcotic. 188 young people will drink alcohol. Could I, could I tell you, I was thinking about this uh, as I was studying. I'll tell you something. And young people, I want you to listen to me. Adults, I want you to listen to me. Alcohol can do nothing to help you, but it can do a whole lot to hurt you. It can do a whole lot to damn your soul to hell. And alcohol is, is, uh, is ravishing our country Alcohol is ravishing our homes. Matter of fact, I want you to listen. I, I, I know you say I always get on alcohol, but, but I want you to hear me tonight. If you're a leader in Blue Ridge View Baptist Church, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a staff member, uh, you lead in worship, uh, whatever it may be, uh, listen to me. Alcohol, there is, there is a, a no-tolerance policy for alcohol. You'll not lead here. You'll not lead in worship here if you partake of alcohol. Amen? And uh, so let's just, let's just clear that up. Preacher, you don't like alcohol, do you? No, I don't. And I believe I can make a case from the Word of God for total abstinence. 
Some of you have asked about that. Well, uh, there's a message back there somewhere that I preached back around Christmas talking about the wrong Christmas spirits or the wrong holiday spirits. You need to pick it up. If you don't like it, chunk it in the trash. Amen? But 285 children will become victims of broken homes in the next 30 minutes. Uh, 228 children will be molested or beaten or some other type of abuse from parents. Why does the Bible exhort us to give our life to Jesus Christ at a young age? Listen to me. It is because without Him, our children stand little chance of facing the challenges before them in this life. And without Him, they have no chance in the life to come. Our young people need direction. Amen? Our young people need absolutes. They, they need to be challenged. They need a voice of authority pointing them in the right direction. We're living in a day, and you've heard me say this before, it's not just the church in general, but it is the church in general. But listen to me, we, we live in a day when our young people are grossly under-challenged in their walk with Jesus Christ. I mean, they are grossly under challenge. You say, preacher, we can't, uh, we won't be able to keep them if if we uh, go through the Book of John on Wednesday nights, or if we don't do this, if we don't play pin the tail on the donkey, or if we don't have a party uh, this night and this night. I mean, if we're not giving them a bunch of entertainment, they're not going to come. Listen to me. I believe, I believe we underestimate our kids when we say that, friend. They will study for a biology exam. And uh, they know all the ins and outs of flowers and shoots and roots and stems and all that good kind of stuff. They'll make a 96 on that test, friend. They can learn the books of the Bible. Amen? Uh, listen, uh, uh, they're under challenge in their walk with Christ. We're doing ministry to youth today the same old, same old way, year after year, and we're getting the same results. Less baptisms, less call to the ministry, less living holy. 4% of U.S. teens are affiliated with an evangelical church. Only 6% of teens, Adam, listen, only 6% of teens saved by age 19 never will be. If they're not saved before they're 19, most will never be saved. We need to reach them right now. 94%, 94% will not come to Christ unless unless they're saved by the age of 19. We need to reach them right now. Hey, Jesus loved children. Jesus loved young people. Jesus, when he preached, he preached plainly. He preached simply. The adults understood Jesus and the children understood Jesus. The intellect and the simple understood or knew what Jesus was getting across in his message. You know what? I just believe people need to understand plainly. Amen? Jesus spoke of, of salvation in common illustrations. He spoke of salvation in common terms. He, he used doors. I am the door. He used the illustrations of, of hunger. I am the bread of life. He used the illustrations of thirst. I am the living water. And so our message today, church, our message needs to be clear. It needs to be a, a simple message, but it needs to be a challenging message. Most every sermon in the New Testament of Christ's sermons, they demanded a response from people. When Christ preached, he demanded a response. Uh, that's the challenge today to our young people. That's the challenge today to our singles and our adults. We need to share the message. We need to live the message. We need to encourage and challenge people to respond to the call of God today. Amen? Invite them to come to Christ. A couple of things I want you to see tonight very quickly. First of all, I want you to notice in our text, here, here's what it tells us. It tells us that Jesus clearly calls children. He clearly calls children. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him. Jesus clearly calls children. Now, I want you to notice right here in verse 2, notice the attention that he gave. He calls this little child unto him, and he set him in the midst. The disciples, they're concerned about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus very quickly grabs their attention by giving his attention to a little child and setting that child in the midst of them. 
And so Jesus was saying, really, if you plan to go to heaven, you've got to become like a little child. We're doing a, a great disservice today to our children and we are quenching their tenderness and their innocence by teaching them when they are young that they have to come like an adult in order to be saved. No, Johnny, you got to understand a little better. No, Mary, uh, you, you don't know enough right now. Listen, you will never understand salvation. There's not a person in here uh, this evening that can understand salvation. You'll never comprehend the love of God. But you can trust in it, amen? You can believe in it. You hear me say this all the time. I said it last Sunday, but we've got to quit uh, telling our children to come like men when Jesus said that the man must come like the little child. Blue Ridge View, hear me tonight. Jesus gave attention to, to the children, and we better give much attention to our children. We better give much attention to our young people. Why is that, preacher? Because the devil is. The world is. Boy, you want to go to some of the greatest entertainment, you just go out there in the world. You want to go hear some of the greatest singers, some of the great great sporting events you want to go to some of the greatest facilities in the world you uh, in the world you just get out there in the world and you'll see how the devil uh, takes pride the devil takes pride in what he offers our young people church it's time we take pride in it amen friend we we need top of the line nursery and preschool facilities we need recreation facilities we need children's facilities that are right up there if not better than what the world has to offer amen some of you not too sure there you know why because it, it, it we're talking about money boy we want to hang on to that money don't we I'll tell you what you, you can hang on to it but it's staying here when you leave out of here it's staying here we need to equip ourselves as a church to be able to equip our children and youth and to build in them fundamental principles and morals that they will remember they learned at Blue Ridge View as a young person. The attention he gave, but the affirmation he gave in, in verse number 2. He affirmed this child in the midst of these adults. He, he brought that child and set him in the midst of them. Hey, we need to be in the business of affirming and encouraging our young people like never before. They may have peers or they will have coaches. They may even have teachers that will get down on them and tell them they're a nobody and tell them they're no good. They need to know. Young people, you need to know that the Bible teaches you were fearfully and wonderfully made and you should not take a back seat to anybody. Uh, young people, you're, you're not who you are because of what kind of athletic ability you may have. You're not who you are because of how smart or how popular or how rich you are, what kind of car you drive. You are who you are because of who made you. And if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are of godly royalty. You're a child of the heavenly king. Amen, church? Jesus clearly calls children. Tonight, maybe he's calling some of ours to be saved. Maybe, young people, he's calling some of you to go into the ministry. Maybe he's calling, and I know he is, he's calling all of us to take a stand where we are. But notice the second thing. Jesus desires to convert children. He desires to convert children. Notice verse number 3, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now notice the condition of children. A couple of things I want you to think about when we're talking about the condition of children. You know what children do? First of all, they're truthful. Amen? Children tell the truth. Be careful what you say at home because a lot of times it comes back to the preacher's ears. Why? Because children just tell the truth. Billy, you like my shirt? No, it's ugly. <laughs> Sadie, you like the shoes that I'm wearing? No, Daddy, they're girly shoes. <laughs> they're truthful. Uh, but second of all, they're tender. They're tender. Uh, children are sensitive about sin. They're sensitive about the things of God as they're young. You know what? I found that little children know that they're sinners. They know they've done something wrong. They know that it disappoints mom and daddy, and they know that it disappoints God. When I'm counseling with children, I always try to come back to the sin question. What is sin? 
And many of them will say, it's, it's the wrong things we do. And I say, like what? And they say, like, slap my sister. Or pull my brother's hair. They know. Stealing, lying. They, they always say, they know that they're sinners. And, and, and children, young people, they'll, they'll weep at a young age. I've seen kids weep over the soul of their daddy. I've seen young people weep over the condition of their home. Listen, we need that today. Men, ladies, once again, we need a broken heart. We need a broken heart over the coldness that's in our own hearts. Amen? We need to shed tears over our complacency, over our lost children. We need to shed tears over the rebellious son or daughter that we have. We need to be broken once again over our sin. We've become so cold and we've become so calloused and we've become so unconcerned and complacent that we don't weep anymore over the conditions in our church, in our life, in our home, among our kids. God, give us wet eyes again. God, give us broken hearts again. I, I've seen kids weep over doing something wrong. They have a tender heart. I've seen kids, I've had it happen to me. They have come to me weeping and crying and begging me to fix a problem in their home. Kids are tender. But notice, notice also, not only the condition of children, but the contribution of children. The country, we're living in the day of the spiritually malnourished child. They don't come to Sunday school anymore. They don't go to VBS anymore. They, they don't come to the youth rally anymore. They're not getting fed spiritually in our day like they should. And parents, this is on us. It's on us. First place I'm a pastor, my friend, is in my home. Not to you, not to Blue Ridge View Baptist Church, but the first place I'm to be pastor is at the Houston household. So it comes back on you and I, your child and you. They need Sunday school. They need worship. Yesterday I was getting screenshots of, uh, of a text that one of our little ones, when I say little, I mean little, little in stature and little in age. Jessica, she, was, she had written some things down and, and uh, she was talking about her love for God and thanking God for, I believe, uh, for his love for her. And then she began to quote uh, the verse that we learned in Vacation Bible School, Search me, O God and try me and she put in that she wrote down and lead me in the way everlasting let me tell you something our kids listen our kids listen we need to give it to them we're living in a day of no remorse no sorrow we live in the day where there's absolutely no guilt over our sin anymore say preacher I don't think people ought to leave church feeling guilty well listen to me if you deal with the sin God reveals to you in your life and you get it right you won't leave guilty the Bible says we're guilty before God if we're not saved. Hey, we ought to feel bad if we're living in sin. Hey, man, if you don't want conviction, go home and watch Joel Osteen tonight. I'm serious. Go buy a Joyce Meyer book. Re hey, you'll feel no conviction of sin. Friend, there will be no conversion without conviction. There will be no cleansing without conviction. There will be no correction without conviction. And conviction makes you feel guilty. Say, so preacher, all you talk, all of that choir sings about. Every time Anna sings, she sings about the blood. Sings about the cross. Every time Stacy sings, y'all get all happy about the blood. Hey, the blood cleanses. The blood sets you free. The blood saves. The cross is the way to heaven. Amen. Now, friend, I, I want everybody to enjoy and experience God here, but you're not going to be happy till you meet God. And then, then think with me about the conversion of children. The conversion. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 challenges us to remember our Creator in the days of our youth. It speaks of the time of salvation. Young people, I hope you listen to what I said a moment ago. If you do not accept Jesus as Savior before the age of 19... 94% of you will die and go to hell. <clears throat> so now's not the time to procrastinate. Now it's not the time to put it off. If God's dealing with you, please come because there will come a time, according to the Bible, when you will not, when you cannot come to God. The Holy Ghost of God will only deal with you for so long. You see, my friend, you don't just wake up one morning thinking, well, I'm just going to go to church today and get saved. Friend, if you think that, the Holy Spirit of God put that in your heart. 
But you can't come until he draws you. And he'll only deal with you for so long. And every time you say no, you're building a wall around your heart, a callousness upon your heart. And the sound of the sweet call of God, the older you get, the fainter and fainter it gets as you grow older. So the time is now, the Bible says. And there's the triumph of salvation. Why does the Bible exhort us to be saved at a young age? It's so that we can live clean, holy, pure, productive, pleasing lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. He clearly calls children to be saved, to surrender, and to serve. He desires to convert children, but notice in verse number 5, he tenderly cares for children. Look at verse 5. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Friend, there ought to be care in our preparation when we're dealing with kids. We, We must prepare to take care of our young people. That may mean more money in the budget for their ministry. It means that when we have teen kid or we have children's church or we have children's worship or we have youth camp or we have summer trips, vacation Bible school, discipleship classes, Sunday school, youth rallies, preschool night like we're having tonight. These are not just activities. They're ministries. And these ministries are for the express purpose of reaching them for Jesus Christ. Friend, we need to do everything we can to get them saturated and surrounded by the love and the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sunday school teacher, those people in your class, those kids in your class, they ought to see the love of God in you. Volunteers around here, our kids, our teenagers, our middle-agers, Our senior adults, listen to me, we ought to be shining the love of God from our heart and from our faces. Care in our preparation, but care also in our protection. We ought to make sure we're protecting them physically and spiritually. Some of you here tonight, and and, and I'm not saying anything one way or the other right now, but if you come and ask my opinion, I'll probably give it to you. But, but listen, if, if, if you allow your child to go to the church of their choice, you better know where they're going. And you better know what they're teaching. I mean, you did know, didn't you, that not every church is a Christian church. You did know, didn't you, that not every church is a Bible-believing church. And I'm going to tell you what, they can get confused and led astray. And there's to be care in our presentation at home. Parents, you ought to share the gospel with your children. Then certainly at church we give care in our presentation. You know what? It's okay every now and then in Sunday school. This is good for the adults too. It's okay every now and then in Sunday school to give an invitation, to invite those little boys and girls, to invite those students in your class to come to Jesus. He clearly calls children. He desires to convert children. He tenderly cares for children, but last of all, he sternly cautions us about children. Notice verse 6, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's pretty plain, huh? Pretty plain. If you cause one to stumble, you will deal with with me. You know what? Around our kids, you know what we need to do? First of all, we need to guard our lips. We need to watch what we say. Amen? You know, our words can be so cruel and, and unchristlike sometimes. I'm going to tell you what, I'll just be very transparent tonight. I, I'm guilty of that. I'm get, Matter of fact, today at lunch, I was greatly convicted about some conversation. My family don't even, they probably don't even know what I'm talking about. I was greatly convicted. You see, I love to laugh, I love to have fun, and I love to joke, but sometimes I laugh and have fun and joke at the expense of others. Preacher, do you really? He's still working on me, too. I have not arrived. I need to put a guard over my lips. That's what the writer of Proverbs says. Put a guard, oh Lord, over my lips. We need to guard our lips. We need to guard our lifestyle. We need to watch what we do. Amen? 
You see, all of us, all of us have influence over others. Uh, somebody in here tonight has somebody that looks up to you. Let's guard our lifestyle. And then we need to guard our loves. I pray that my children will not see me putting anything in my life before Jesus Christ, including them. I want you to write this down somewhere. I, I have it. I have pictures in my Bible, and I've got a picture of myself and Sadie Grace when she was probably a year old, and she's sitting in my lap. I, I just want you to write this down. We're talking about guarding our loves. What I love in moderation, my children will love in excess. Please think about that. What I love in moderation, my children very well may love in excess. Well, that'll put a guard over your life, over your loves. Reading about a man who, for many years, he would not go to church. He cared nothing for Christ. He cared nothing for the Bible. He was hostile to anything and everything Christian. And as his little girl grew up, he influenced her in the same way. What he loved, she grew to love in excess. He would take her everywhere he went on the weekend, obviously except to church. His wife, uh, her mother, was a devoted, committed Christian. That little girl thought the sun and the moon rose in her daddy. And so one day that little girl got sick. And on her deathbed, on her deathbed, this man screamed, Take your mother's Christ. Take your mother's Christ. That little girl died with no response audibly. This man to this day who later came to Christ and became a Christian, he says now that he lives in a saved man's hell because he does not know of his little girl, the apple of his eye. He does not know she took her mama's Christ. Dads, moms, leaders, somebody's watching us. Little eyes, teenage eyes, young adult eyes are upon us. It would be better for us to tie a rock around our neck and jump into the deepest part of the sea than for us to say an idle word, live a haphazard life, or love something more than we love God and influence our kids to do the same. We might as well just hang a stone around our neck and go jump in Lake Kiowa, never to come up again. Let the little children come. Our kids taught us a song. We learned a song as a child. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Friend, I, I, want, you, I want you to keep praying. And I want you to pray every week, and I want you to take time to pray on Saturday night before you go to bed, God, keep saving people at Blue Ridge View Baptist Church. And God, keep saving these little ones. Keep saving these children. That they may grow to be mighty men and women of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.